Ah, uh, yes. I can do that now. Actually, in Latin America, as a langostero, which is a sort of a grasshopper cowboy, is a loose term. Did you have any slides that you wanted to present, Hector, or are you just going to chat? Uh, no, uh, I. No worries. Uh, Rick, quizá podría mostrar uh, el mismo, la misma presentación que usamos en. Um, en el Congreso de Entomología. Bueno, sí, pero si no está listo, está bien. Okay. O sea, no tienes que hacer ninguna. Está bien, solo podemos charlar. O sea, no, okay. no, no tiene sentido hacer eso. Ok. Uh, so, oh. yeah, I explained this a little bit to Hector, but um, we're, and he knows a little bit about the project. I think you talked to Hojun about it in the past. But um, this is a large um, National Science Foundation funded virtual institute. Um, so it's a big five year project. We're one year in. Um, and basically, it's the National Science Foundation of the US funds some of these big initiatives, which are integrative um, institutions in biology. And what it does is it kind of forms a virtual institution between several other universities or institutions. Um, and so um, we're and we're a small component of that project, um, which is the outreach committee. Um, which the outreach um, committee is, um, is, I don't think there's a direct translation for outreach in Spanish, but we're the part of the committee that is um, basically focused on like education and external communication of this project. And the project in general is um, focused on understanding uh, behavioral phenotypic plasticity using locusts as a, as a model to understand phenotypic plasticity more broadly in biology, since locusts do such a good job at, at, um, at phenotypic plasticity in general and are kind of a, um, a very cool case of it for it biologically. So, um, so we're really looking at, at plasticidad phenotypica de la langosta and cómo, cómo hace eso el langosta, cómo cambia su forma, su, su fisiología, su morfología, su comportamiento y estamos tratando de entender eso genéticamente, o sea, cómo puede con un solo genoma hacer todo esto. Um, and so, yeah, it looks like Hugo might be trying to join us. So um, thank you, thanks for joining us. So Hector, as I was mentioning before, is the national coordinator for the Grasshopper and Locust Program for SENASA, which is the direct equivalent of our USDA. Um, I think you just got another title, right, Hector? The... Uh, I'm not sure. It's equivalent this. Okay. No, uh, no. Um, it's, it's a pleasure for, for me. Uh, so it's okay. I'm sorry for my, my English. It's, it's bad. Perfect. I know, but Rick is it's a, it's a, my personal Traductor, is traductor is correct, no? Translator. Mm -hmm. uh, translator, sir. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, Hugo is uh, is in the in the field uh, now. Is okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Yes. Um, so yeah, we're kind of excited to just hear a little bit from you, Hector, about like what Sinasa does generally. I think, and then like what a day in the life of Hector is like. <laughs> And okay. feel free to speak in English and I can like jump in and you can just ask me words and or feel free to drop, you know, talk okay. in Spanglish and move back and forth between English and Spanish if you want. Okay. So uh, actually, actually just quickly, maybe just say one, one more, you know, sort of word, word of introduction. Um, just, I, I just kind of wanted to frame it, a, you know, a, a little bit differently than Rick, although I think Rick did a great, um, Give a great overview. There's not a lot of funding right now in science for research on locusts. Um, so our center um, and, and research on locust swarms and on how they work and how they do damage. Um, and so you have this big global problem that really doesn't get a lot of scientific funding. Now our center has very specific scientific goals but it also broadly is one of the best funded 
scientific efforts right now um, looking at the process of locust swarming from the perspective of basic science and research. And what we really would like to do at this stage, right? The, we do have a big educational mission, but we also, because this effort is actually, it's a, it's a five year long effort and it's just starting now, um, you know, we're just starting our second year. A big part of our goal is actually to educate ourselves about the nature of the locust problem globally. Um, and to understand who else is working in this area so that we can contribute as much as we can to the global community. And so that's, you know, where we're coming from in, in these conversations is trying to have conversations with people who are leaders in, you know, in this area so that we can better appreciate what they're doing um, and use that to educate and inform our own research. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so if you, does that, did that, does that make sense, Hector? Let me know if you don't understand anything. Más o menos lo que estamos, lo que está tratando de decir que lo que obviamente estamos acá como haciendo mucha investigación biológica, pero lo que no tenemos, no estamos más, O sea, como no estamos involucrados en lo que está pasando obviamente con gestión, con manejo de pestia, um, estamos tratando de interconectar para ver cuáles, son, cuáles serían las aplicaciones de, de nuestra investigación en, en ese contexto y en ese tema. Por eso es importante que hablamos con gente como vos. Well, I can... Okay, yeah, I, I can understand, you. yes. It looks like Hugo might still be trying to join us, but. Um, I don't know, it's, uh, it's more fácil para mí um, entender que, que hablar en inglés. Entonces, no te preocupes tanto, no, no te preocupes tanto por, la, por la traducción, sino por, por cómo yo hablo en inglés. It's easier for him to understand than speak in Spanish. <laughs> so he understands more than he's letting on. He wants to, you know. <laughs> So yeah, Hector, did you want to just chat a little bit? I mean, about uh, Sinasa, just like really broadly, like what they do and what your role is in, at Sina okay. in Sinasa. So, um, bueno, Sinasa is an institution similar to Leifi in the United States. We work with the sanity and quality of agricultural and langosta is a part, a very small part of all institution that is in all in the country. So Sinasa is really similar to APHIS in the United States, actually. So I guess that's a better direct comparison than what I was saying with the USDA. Um, and the, the locust program is a very small part of everything that, that they do and manage. Las langostas son muy importantes para Argentina y para Sudamérica porque las primeras iniciativas de los gobiernos contra plagas y enfermedades fueron justamente con, contra langostas. The lang the but locusts, even though they are a small part of that overall program, they are really um, sort of a, they are a really keystone part of the uh, plant health management program because they were one of the very first things that uh, led to the development of Sinasa actually in the early history of Sinasa, like early outbreaks and plagues of locusts. De hecho, el programa actual de langostas que yo coordino nació en 1891. Es decir, son más de 100 años. De, de historia en el manejo de langosta que tiene Argentina. So the Logos program itself is over 100 years old. Um, nosotros tuvimos una situación de calma durante 60 años y en el año 2015 una resurgencia de, de la plaga, una emergencia que afectó a varios países de, de la región de Sudamérica. Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay, pero también puso en riesgo a Brasil y a Uruguay. So after about a 60 year hiatus, the like locusts came back with a vengeance in 2015 and spilled over into several neighboring countries, Brazil, Uruguay, uh, Bolivia, uh, ¿qué más? Paraguay. Paraguay. Yes. Uh, and uh, in the last year, uh, uh, to Brazil and Uruguay. Mm. 
Um, what, what more? Um, Could you maybe explain a little bit the relationship that you have with farmers and like okay. the coord like coordination? You have farmers, you have langosteros. Like, what does okay. your day in your life look like? <laughs> Uh, en Argentina, a diferencia de lo que pasa en, en África, um, eh, nosotros trabajamos mucho con, con los agricultores. En África, el control de la plaga está casi en totalidad en manos de, de, del Estado o de FAO. Acá es un, un sistema mixto, ¿no? donde interviene el Estado, pero también los productores son responsables del control. Y eso es un desafío bastante difícil, ¿no? In Argentina, he, like it's, there's potentially a very fundamentally different structure in the way that locusts are managed. It's much more intimately involved with farmers that are on the ground in direct communication in real time. Whereas in contrast, in the sort of African situation, it's uh, much more top-down control with FAO and the UN and heads of state. Um, and the Argentina situation's strengths and weaknesses, one is just the challenge of, of interacting with and coordinating with all those, those farmers on the ground in real time. Y ha sido un desafío muy difícil porque, como les conté, durante 60 años no hubo langostas, entonces todo el mundo se había olvidado de las langostas. Los productores, el gobierno, los investigadores, cuando llegó la langosta es como que no muchos sabían qué hacer y eso fue un desafío bastante importante para nosotros. Huge challenge was a 60 year um, memory deletion of everyone involved, of investigators, practitioners, farmers who just forgot about locusts um, across the board. So like big memory wipe and then starting from scratch again in 2015. Un problema adicional que tenemos en Argentina muchas veces es la falta de, de, de recursos para poder afrontar esta plaga también. Es una realidad. La que la dice uh, recursos es, um, es money, no? Mm. And the, yeah, just like a yeah. lack of consistent resources to bootlace, to bootstrap like the program back up again. Yes. Um, y desde 2015 estamos trabajando con, con varios investigadores. Bueno, GLI es un, un actor principal para nosotros, pero hemos logrado. Eh, trabajar con investigadores a nivel mundial, con distintos países de la región, con los agricultores. Al principio fue muy difícil, pero hoy está un poco mejor la, la situación de gestión, ¿no? Después de cinco años, eh, la, la situación ha cambiado uh, y estamos bien, bien posicionados. In the, the last, uh, he's last uh, since 2015, there's been a huge amount of work to reconnect with partners. Um, both like internally and internationally and FAO and with the GLI, he said, which he also said the GLI is a really awesome, cool organization, the best of all of them. <laughs> now he didn't say that. Uh, uh, and but so there's been a huge amount of capacity building and networking to sort of rebuild a structure for the monitoring and management of locusts. Uh, yo siempre cuando hablo de langostas uso una, una, una frase que no sé qué tan fácil va a ser traducirla, Rick, pero que siempre usa eh, Mario Pot de México. Y él dice que uh, existen dos, dos tipos de plagas, ¿no? Una son las langostas y el resto todas las demás. Y eso es que hace distinto su manejo, ¿no? Esta característica que hace formación de enjambres, que se mueva más de 150 kilómetros en un día, hace que el manejo sea completamente distinto a cualquier otra plaga que uno puede imaginarse. He's borrowing a term, turn of phrase from a collaborator of his, Mario Putpec, who's in Mexico, yeah. who says that there's two types of plagues. One is a normal plague and one is a locust plague. And so just pointing out that like the idiosyncrasies of locusts are so crazy that they require like a, with their like crazy flight distances and insane boom and bust cycles and phase change just requires like a totally different approach to management than every other crop pest. No sé si habrán visto algún enjambre de langostas alguna vez, les puedo mostrar un video, pero imagínense que una plaga hoy está en un país y al día siguiente está en otro. Y eso, imagínenselo en un productor, que de un día para el otro tenga una nube de langostas en su campo que en cuestión de pocos minutos le coma toda su producción. Eso hace que la gestión de langostas sea muy compleja y todo lo que tiene que ver con anticiparse a la llegada de, de la plaga eh, es muy importante. So yeah, just uh, yeah, just imagine, you know, you're a farmer and just the, the difficulties of a locust plague that like you're a farmer and literally like immediately 
in an instant, like a huge cloud shows up and eats everything. Um, and then just the challenges of dealing with a, that, that mobile of a, of a plague. En ese sentido, desde Argentina tuvimos la necesidad de trabajar con otros países. Bolivia y Paraguay son los, los principales. Uh, hay un movimiento migratorio de la plaga entre los tres países. ¿no? En África es más grande, se mueve por muchos más países. En la región de Sudamérica son principalmente esos tres. Uh, that, that, that mobility requires a lot of international coordination, obviously. They work principally with Bolivia and Paraguay. Um, and then obviously the situation in Africa even involves a lot more countries and coordination. Um, de hecho, con, con Rick nos conocimos en Bolivia, trabajando juntos. Eh, y hace algunos años también tuve la posibilidad de acompañar el equipo del GLI en algunas investigaciones en Paraguay, ¿no? tratando de de trabajar de forma colaborativa entre los tres países y de hecho tenemos conformado uh, un plan regional de manejo uh, para la langosta. And then he's uh, yeah talking about the some of the collaborations that we've that the GLI have done in the field in Argentina and and then later in Paraguay um, with early research looking at swarming locusts and their nutritional ecology. Um, and right now, Hector, side note, is uh, trying to look for eggs of cancellata for us. So he's, there's not a lot of eggs right now, but he's looking for a BPRI cancellata eggs to send to us. <laughs> so he has um, his work looking for them. Um, y recientemente, desde Argentina, uh, lanzamos un proyecto de un sistema um, regional de monitoreo, o sea, de carga de información de monitoreo y emisión de alertas por langostas que involucra a todos los países de, de la región. They've recently uh, just um, set up an early warning system with their, which they're very excited and proud about. They just had a webinar um, about it um, that involves three countries, Hector? Or, oh, it's, it's or uh, the, whole, the whole region. No, it's seven, yes. Yeah, seven it's countries. Regional. Yes. So it's a kind of a first attempt. Um, I, was, I was able to attend the webinar. It's a kind of a first attempt at setting up a an international regional platform as an early warning system with like a GIS based um, interface similar to what FAO has. So. Y, y no quería, bueno, Hugo no se puede, tiene problemas de conexión, pero en nuestro, nuestro fuerte cuando empezó la emergencia fue lo que nosotros llamamos langosteros, uh, locus cowboy, ¿no? Porque nosotros teníamos personas que se dedicaron toda su vida a trabajar con langosta. De hecho, Hugo hace 40 años que se dedica exactamente lo mismo. Entonces, de ellos fuimos aprendiendo un poco cómo era la, la gestión de la langosta y eso lo pudimos aplicar a, a, toda la, a, a todo el personal de Senasa que estaba afectado. O sea, no muchos conocíamos cómo se manejaba, pero teníamos cuatro o cinco personas que conocían muy bien eh, ese trabajo y ese fue nuestro, nuestro principal fuerte, ¿no? que la gente, gente al dentro de Argentina que tienen la experiencia yeah. de eso antes de, antes de 2015 yes. había como cinco personas, cuatro o cinco sí. personas. y esas son las personas que viajaron a otros lugares como a los yes. otros países Exacto. ¿te entendí bien? Oh. Yes. Yes. Ah, yeah. so they, they did ¿Cómo, ¿cómo es que tenían esa experiencia? But, que uh, como había ese como rango okay. de tiempo de 60 años. Sí, es que ellos desde, trabajaron desde siempre, digamos. O sea, eh, el, la, la, las tareas de langosta nunca se detuvieron en Argentina, por lo cual desde 1950, 60, siempre hubo langosteros. Se fueron jubilando, pero siempre hubo. Cuando okay. comenzó en 2015, teníamos cinco personas que tenían más de 40 o 50 años de experiencia en langosta. There were, yeah, that makes sense. There, there was always really low levels of locusts during the 60 years, um, but just never outbroke to crazy levels. And so there was always a group of core people that were remobilized and had to retrain everyone um, when things got crazy again in 2015. And those were the people that were involved in interchanges between countries to transfer um, institutional knowledge. Um, so, uh, yeah, Rez has a question. Did you want to read your question, Rez? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, I think you might be on mute, Arez. So, sorry, sorry about that. Hector, thank you. This is really wonderful. Um, and I'm learning so much just, just listening uh, to you. So I, I had a few different questions. One I, is I wanted to follow up on the early warning system. So let's suppose that you get information from an early warning system that a locust you know, swarm is about to get to you. Uh, 
what do you do with that information? Okay. Um, bueno, um, lo, que, lo que tienen las... Um, nosotros eh, descubrimos o creemos haber descubierto el movimiento migratorio que tiene la langosta en la región. Entonces, cuando el equipo de Paraguay detecta, eh, detecta un enjambre de forma temprana, ¿sí? el, el sistema automáticamente va disparando avisos por, eh, por un radio de distancia. Entonces, cuando hay una manga que se detecta en Paraguay, yo estoy a 2.000 kilómetros y en ese momento yo lo conozco. Y el país de Uruguay también, y Brasil también, y Bolivia también. Entonces, a partir de ese momento, comenzamos a prepararnos a lo que podría venir. Rick, uh, después continúo porque es largo. Maybe. No? I'm sorry. You, you are cool. Now I'm muted. Generally speaking, one of the things that they're trying to do first, he kind of starts off with the thought of like, they're really trying to understand the macro like swarm movement patterns in South America. So if like Paraguay, it's, it's, you know, if it's like they have a detection of a swarm 2000 kilometers away in Paraguay, there's kind of two things going on. So one is that, you know, in theory, they, they could prepare if they know which direction it's going, as you might imagine, kind of like a weather map. Um, and then they're also trying to, this early warning system they're hoping is going to be like early fodder for even just understanding, like, how are these things moving? Are there any predictable patterns with like how they're moving in the continent that are like seasonally affected, et cetera? Because it's really. Right. You know, I guess um, I don't mean so much from the research standpoint, but mm -hmm. from the standpoint of yeah. like, suppose the farmer realizes a locust swarm is about to arrive to, you know, their farm what do they do or suppose a government finds out hey a locust swarm is about to you know mm -hmm. hit what does the you know what does the mayor of pound do what is the what is the government expected to do um yeah yeah and hector because you also have a phone app right that like farmers and members of the general public report occurrences right también hay una app por teléfono que que la gente como un granjero o sea un farmer puede submitir que han visto langosta, langosta ¿no? Sí, nosotros, es otra cosa. nosotros tenemos una, una red, entonces eh, tenemos el monitoreo oficial y después tenemos una red de personas que están todo el tiempo en el campo, nosotros los reconocemos y hay dos formas de que ellos puedan avisar, ¿no? Uh -huh. A través de un email, uh, phone, eh, a través de una aplicación móvil o incluso nosotros también los llamamos cada vez periodo de tiempo para preguntarle cómo está la situación. No solamente si hay langostas o no, sino cómo está mm. la vegetación, si llovió o si no llovió, porque son factores que nosotros nos determinan que la langosta podría llegar a, a prosperar. So yeah, kind of a side issue, but they also have this kind of like citizen scientist reporting farmer, like reporting network. And then Hector Arez is asking, ¿cómo que, que haría una persona con ese conocimiento? O sea, si vos sos un langostero, digo, un, un granjero, y recibís uh -huh. una noticia que si están viniendo, o van a venir la langosta, o sea, ¿qué, ¿cuál sería la reacción en el campo en, entre Senasa y los granjeros? O sea, ¿cuál, ah, okay. qué, ser, qué, ¿qué harían? No, nos preparamos para, para la guerra nosotros. <laughs> we prepare for war. <laughs> yes. <And> so, <laughs> how do you prepare for war? Like, how do yes. you, I don't know how you fight against locusts. <laughs> like, the guy is going to walk up to my house. I, I have an idea how I would prepare for that. <laughs> ah, prepare. Uh, they, We have, eh, nosotros tenemos eh, muchos protocolos de cómo actuar, de manejo. ¿no? Entonces, tenemos una guía de cómo controlar, tenemos una guía de cómo hacer un control con un avión, por ejemplo, con qué dosis, a qué altura, a qué hora. Tenemos un protocolo de cómo controlar sin afectar a las abejas. Eh, tenemos todo una, muchas guías armadas para saber cómo actuar en, en ese momento. Yeah, the, yeah they mo there's a huge amount of mo um, SOPs, basically, or guides for, like, um, decision making for, like, vehicles versus cars versus um, for pesticide spraying, depending on the environment, like, potential human health hazards next to water, et cetera, so, like, a response is mobilized. So is the response centered on pesticides? Basically, it's about where to deploy the pesticides, what vehicles to use in deploying the pesticides, what the pesticides to deploy. Is that the uh, is that how it works? 
it's like a it's yeah. pesticide center. I, I realize that this is probably very, very obvious to hackers. Yeah, but, nice. You know, but, but it's it's like pesticide focused. That's the weapon, right? I, you know, if somebody's, you know, entering my, you know, my property, like a good Texan, I pull out my, you know, rifle with my scope, right? That's <laughs> there, right? But like, uh, you know, if locusts are showing up, then you take your vehicles with pesticide. La, this, ¿Le entendiste? Está, es, está diciendo que no sabe, la, no, o sea, no sabe casi nada de, de la, la, la respuesta que, que tienen ustedes. Entonces, la gran mayoría de la estrategia tiene que ver con pesticido o, y lo, eh, o, o sea, no hay otras cosas. No están cavando como canales o nada así. O sea, no hay otras respuestas que... Bueno, well, uh, en realidad la, la principal estrategia es lo que nosotros conocemos como manejo preventivo, que es lo que estamos haciendo ahora. Uh, o sea, el monitoreo permanente y un control temprano. Un control temprano de ninfas eh, es sencillo. El problema es cuando se forma un enjambre. Cuando uh -huh. se forma un enjambre no hay otra alternativa que, que el control químico y un avión para poder frenarlo, lamentablemente. Uh -huh. There's a, yeah, the con, there's a kind of a constant monitoring. The first response, so to speak, the pre-response is like constant monitoring and then like small targeted pesticide sprays to basically punch things down before that are localized. So team of the Langosteros are out there monitoring that a little outbreaks pop up and they're like on the scene, target spraying um, to basically, it's like, it's like fire management. You're like suppressing it before it has a chance to get, go crazy. But once it's at like swarm levels, that's like a, a totally different story. So uh, is it uh, the swarm, is it the swarm? Cause like, I guess the swarm's not here yet. The swarm's coming from Paraguay say, right? There's a swarm on the way from Paraguay. Mm -hmm. got folks, they're out in the field, they're monitoring, and if they see like a few locusts, what they want to make sure is that like, you know, when the swarm shows up, it doesn't see, hey, check it out, there's a party down there, let's land, right? So what they want to do is prevent those very first people, or those very first locusts from like starting something, getting something started, and they just want the locust swarm to move on. Is that is that the idea? Is like, I can't fight this locust swarm, but I can make it not pay attention to this spot, but keep going and affect something else? Is, is that the logic? The, um, the, main, the main thing that Hector's talking about right now is actually like trying to punch down the babies. So it's like nymphs are emerging, they can't fly yet. And so they're very restricted locally. So they start marching around, feeding, growing bigger, accumulating. And if you don't suppress that, then and they get to the adult stage, then they start flying, they can join up with other swarms, and then it becomes this like continental level. So it's thing. like the movie Outbreak. You, you don't want it yeah. to get airborne, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I look, look at this map. Uh, I, walk, I, uh, I am working in this map. Uh, Rick, this is a un, map that I'm working on of all the areas that were monitored in NASA el, during the 2021. These are the current monitoring areas that they're like, uh, actually monitoring. Fueron más de 4.400 zonas o áreas que fueron vigiladas. Y, y en solo el 7% encontramos langostas. Esto es lo que es la vigilancia permanente, o, eh, digamos, en donde no hace falta control. Y si se encontraba langostas, se hace un control temprano. Esto es una situación ideal. This is a permanent kind of monitoring effort that is uh, part of the early detection system. Pero el problema no siempre es de Argentina, sino que si esto está todo tranquilo, probablemente venga una manga de Paraguay, que Paraguay es esta zona que está acá. This is Paraguay, yes. Uh, yeah, um, one, of the, one of the challenges of not collaborating internationally, which is kind of what was happening before, is that like if the other, what's happening in another country is a black box and you don't know what's going on over there, there's this crazy refugia where you might be monitoring everything, but then a, a billion locusts show up at your doorstep overnight. <laughs> Entonces, por ahí la, la respuesta a, uh, uh, say is Eres, Eres in Spanish is, I'm sorry, what, what is, uh, Ines. Uh, um, this is stress your, your name. Level, right? yeah, yeah, no, okay. that, that's my name. It comes from the word for cedar. Ah, okay. It's like, uh, it's the Hebrew version of like the English name Cedric. Ah. Um, nuestro, nuestra principal respuesta es esto, monitoreo permanente, para so evitar response. la formación de enjambres. Yeah, the first response is this, like, permanent monitoring. And then, 
So then like for Erez's question, Hector, like what would you do if you know that a giant swarm is coming from Paraguay? Like what kind of effort would be mobilized in Argentina, for example? Um, and and look, at, uh, look at this. This is my, my first swarm. Uh, one second, please. Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> look. <laughs> this is the local swarm. It's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, if this is on the way, if this yeah. is on the way, what do you do? This is a millions and millions of locals. Yeah, no, that that looks like looks like billions. And 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 look, look at this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Uh, y, y en ese momento solo podemos admirar lo que está pasando. No hay otra cosa. Que, the, que at that moment, to answer your question, Arez, all they do is look at it and watch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so. so, so it, uh, the swarm before it becomes a swarm. Right, you have to stop it from deciding to swarm. Right, you have to prevent the locusts from growing up to be adults that will join the swarm. That's the strategy. Is que toda la idea es parar es pararlo antes de que llegue a ser un en un en hambre. This is the this is the idea. Yeah, and you have to find them. Right, in order to do that, you have to find them. And once you found some of them, so I guess I'm just trying to put together a picture. Right, you see a few of the adults. Then you say, uh oh, there must be many nymphs. I'm going to go, you know, use pesticides very extensively to try to get rid of these nymphs so that they contribute relatively few adults. And in this way, you hope to keep, you know, the population down. But of course, some adults get away. And if too many of them are able to form um, and develop, then you will end up getting a swarm, at which point you just have to stand back and do nothing. Uh, help me. I'm sorry. Um, bueno, sí, sí. bueno, la idea está solo tratando de, de ver qué entiende él, que el, toda la, la estrategia en total es solo pararlos antes de que lleguen a ser un, un enjambre. Por, y está como preguntando más o menos como si hay algo que puedes hacer cuando ya está en ese nivel o no, no hay nada que hacer. No, bueno, lo, lo que pasa es que en, cuando llega a ese nivel, nuestro principal foco es poder controlarlo. No en ese momento, sino que toda una estrategia armada del momento de, de control, que generalmente se hace al, al amanecer, en algunos países se hace por la noche, cuando la langosta deja de volar. Entonces se arma todo un operativo uh -huh. para poder hacer el, el control. Generalmente sin luz, eso hace que sea mucho más difícil. The, yeah, basically, Erez, what you said, it's like all about preventative, sort of like trying to catch those early wildfires, so to speak, before they get in the air and then start flying hundreds of kilometers and laying eggs and seeding new things like your, you know, outbreak model. And then when it does get to crazy levels, then there's a huge amount of work, but it's basically like a long slog of like m a lot more spraying constant work, constant control work, and like finding them at nighttime when they're like settled down in trees and bushes and like constant control applications and lots of pesticides. Even if there's a to big slowly swarm, punch it down. Even if there's a big swarm, what you do is it's not you don't give up, right? You just say, okay, well, yeah. they're in the air right now. I can't get them in the air, but I'm going to wait till they land and exactly. I'll get them there. Yeah. Huh. How can you monitor? Is there like, do you have satellites or other things that you can use to monitor these swarms? They must be visible from space. What is the data input for the monitoring system? ¿Lo están usando satélites o cómo lo, cómo? Para, para identificar las mangas, decís. Sí, bueno, en el sistema de monitoreo. No. O, como que están usando para, para saber dónde están. Lo más importante para nosotros son los, los monitoreadores que sabemos, la, sabemos las, el, el área donde la langosta está generalmente, por lo cual vamos a frecuentar esos lugares, vamos a revisar esos lugares, y después nos guiamos mucho por condiciones ambientales, fundamentalmente las precipitaciones y el estado de vegetación, y la idea en este sistema es empezar a trabajar con 
eh, el BDI con información satelital de índice de, de verdor, de humedad, digamos. Pero bueno, es todo un desafío también, porque quizás nosotros no tenemos suficiente experiencia y se necesitan investigadores que entiendan un poco más ¿no? de, de cómo se trabaja. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I know personally, Erez, that there, I know there is, has been some sort of like weather tracking and stuff with locusts, like on the FA, like with the desert locusts, but I don't know how practical it is. But Hector's saying like for their system, it's all like ground technicians, like citizen science reporting. And then critically in DVI, like looking the vegetation, like a lot of the areas where these locusts are in South America in the Chaco region, they're sort of similar to like the Sonoran Desert here in Arizona. It's like dry and then it's like really unpredictable localized rain, crazy patches of green. And so in DVI or like looking at like satellite imagery of like where the green is, not the locust per se, is a critical part of, of guessing and like focusing monitoring efforts. So you're not just driving around randomly like a spaz all over Argentina. And that's a big um, critical part of the monitoring that feeds into the model. A, a really, I mean, again, this is stupid, very speculative sorts of questions, but like the cost of putting up satellites is decreasing very rapidly right now. You know, is there, would there be value? I mean, if, you know, it was possible to raise the funds to put a satellite there whose principal job was to monitor locusts, would people yeah. be, you know, would this be very valuable? Because like, you know, there's also an issue, of course, you know, any locust monitoring satellite could also, you know, monitor your next door neighbor, your next door neighbor might not like that, their government might not like that, etc. But actually, you could imagine putting up a satellite that had coarse enough resolution that it wasn't terribly useful as a spy satellite, but, you know, could notice a humongous brown smudge, you know, several kilometers wide moving along the landscape. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. would it be Is this at all practical? Would there be a desire for that if there was like some way to get mm. satellite data? Conoces Héctor si hay, conoces si hay como si el el FAO lo, está observando los la, la enjambre justo justo con satélites o como si lo puedes ver. Oh. Está en, preguntando en eres si si sería si con más dinero con más plata si sería como si sería posible realmente observarlos por satélite? Uh, no, no estoy seguro. Nosotros hemos tratado con, con, con CONAE, que es la Comisión Nacional de Aeroespacial de Argentina, que tiene algunos satélites en órbita, pero depende mucho del, del, de la resolución que tenga, digamos, el, el tamaño de la manga y el momento en el día que pasa el satélite, digamos. Entonces, en ese sentido, es bastante difícil. Lo que sí estamos tratando de, de hacer es trabajar en modelos Mm. Eh, que hacen referencia al posible movimiento de la manga. He's, Entonces, he's saying, oh, go ahead. Sorry. He's saying like the direct tracking with the satellites, there's been like one-off things with that and it's possible, but it's sensitive to the resolution, the time of day that the satellite's passing over and the size, there's like a size threshold of the swarm. Um, but I think th that some of that is possible, but they're more interested in like the vegetation models, because they have a like much higher resolution and like sort of eagle eye view of all that in real, more real time. And then models, which predict, that predict like where the movements of these things are going, so. De, de hecho, nosotros nos guiamos mucho por, uh, por algunos, estamos tratando de, de hacer modelos para ver uh, el movimiento. De hecho, en FAO hay, digamos, Cyril Pew los lo tiene, de intentar ver, el, la, predecir el movimiento de una manga. Entonces... Eh, mm. Sobre todo teniendo en cuenta el viento, que es lo que hace que se muevan. Y se the wind, de modeling de... wind and modeling wind and have that be part of the like feed into the algorithm of the modeling system too. It's like really... Y hay algunos modelos que tiene FAO que yo, yo traté de aplicar para nuestra langosta y no funcionaron del todo bien. Entonces estamos buscando modelos they've, distintos, parecidos you, pero distintos. They've used some of the UN models for the desert locust and they're not terribly great, possibly just because of different context and so that's another thing that they're working on optimizing um de hecho rick el, el 23 de febrero estamos organizando eh, un seminario de sensores remotos para detección de on the de langostas 23rd, Santa Montes. on the 23rd of february they're hosting a remote sensing locust workshop so you're all invited <laughs> we'll post it on hopper link actually like something that would be phenomenal right um that could be really interesting um and yeah. that's that's a way to plug in for a lot of people actually potentially beyond that community right who could plug in from the comfort of you know their home and 
you know, Houston or New York or the Silicon Valley and, and contribute a lot of new methods that are developing that would be really relevant to like, you know, remote sensing um, or locust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I'm uh, like humongously hogging everything. Barani, Barani <laughs> asked a good question for Hector, huh? which is what triggered the sudden swarming in 2015 after 60 years, Hector? Uh, Hector, Hector and I are actually, Hector and I are actually first time co-authors together on a paper that just uh, came last week that explores those themes. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's a very it's, good it's question, una, controversial it's una, question. <laughs> es una buena pregunta, pero no tenemos la respuesta. Um, um, hay un trabajo de un australiano, David Hunter, que él asocia um, precipitaciones en determinados años, lluvias, que podrían desencadenar el aumento poblacional. Um, es muy técnico, pero tengan en cuenta que la langosta tiene una capacidad reproductiva muy alta. Entonces, eh, su crecimiento es casi exponencial. Entonces, eh, de generación en generación. Entonces, si las condiciones climáticas son muy buenas, hay un crecimiento tal que hace que no se pueda frenar, digamos. Y eso sería lo que, que ocurrió en el año 2000, 2015. Como uh, perdí el, la parte en el, en el medio. Como pueden, como pueden crecer en una manera muy exponencial. Y ah, por, bien, por no, la cantidad. No estaba pasando sí. antes del 2015. Porque en realidad el crecimiento está asociado a las precipitaciones y Ajá. la vegetación disponible. Uh -huh. En so, determinadas áreas, ¿no? Yeah. One of the, this is my words, not Hector's. One of the things, one of the, I think, existing narratives just for context was that, so um, Sinasa in the like mid 20th century had like a very, as an ex extensive locust management campaign using DDT. And so one of the sort of internal government narratives is that basically they, the management program was like very successful and DDT was successful and they like punched them way down and they were like problem solved. Um, this is not a problem anymore. Correct me if I'm wrong, Hector. Um, okay. So that is one narrative. Um, but, um, but in 2015, they kind of came back with a vengeance and as Hector is saying, um, the increased precipitation and warmer winters were like strongly implicated in that because they can grow insanely exponentially, but they usually get punched down by dry weather or by cold winters. And what has been observed like since 2015 is they'll actually get a third generation um, going into the winter because it's warm enough. And then, so that's when you get this like crazy ramp up the exponential curve. Um, and Argentina had a series of like very wet and very mild winters um, that were um, coincident with all this happening. So that's, that's strongly implicated. So lots of obvious um, things to think about with changing climate and modeling the effects that that's gonna have. We also, as Ho Jun and Derek Waller from previously from the USDA have, have reminded and warned us is we have a locust species that's knocking on our southern border in the US in Texas. And um, the, there's a, the, the, um, it's piece of fronds, just a circa piece of fronds is like a couple of recent outbreaks have almost made it to Texas and have kind of then gone back down into Mexico. So there's a little think tank inside the USDA talking about that with climate change. So we might not be able to say we don't have a locust species anymore in a couple decades. Decís que detectaron la langosta centroamericana en Texas. Casi, casi. No ha llegado, pero recién en los últimos dos o tres años ha casi llegado, casi llegó a la frontera. Okay. Which is also like, yeah, the thinking is like warming climate that they're moving northward. So... So I was curious, have, you know, Google actually does a whole bunch of work to support remote sensing applications. They have this tool called Google Earth Engine. I don't know if, uh, you know, if, if uh, there's been any use of this, but this seems like the kind of thing. Yes, I know, but, uh, see, conozco la herramienta, uh, 
estudié un poquito de geomática, pero escapa, a, yo soy ingeniero agrónomo, entonces escapa mucho mi, 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 mi conocimiento, si esa, si esa fue tu, tu pregunta puntual. Sí, como si hay un beneficio de usarlo eso, ah, yeah. pero decís que es difícil de entender o... No, para mí, pero por, por claro, la producción, claro. digamos. Eh, mm. Conozco la herramienta, yo He's creo like, que puede haber una posibilidad de uso, that. pero... And he poked into it a little bit, but it's kind of above his knowledge level, but he's not like an intense modeler. But there are a lot of these modeling efforts going on and people, I mean, a lot. <laughs> you know. I, I am the use to hit. This is something where perhaps there might be some opportunities, right? It sounds like maybe Hector has, you know, like some problems uh -huh. using this, but they don't necessarily have the expertise. To, to do it, but this is actually like, it's a platform for doing sort of cloud-based computation over, you know, satellite images. So for, you know, remote sensing applications. And mm. you can see it's actually, you know, it's like designed for you to, you know, edit, um, you know, the code in a browser and sort of run it through, um, you know, Google Cloud. Uh, you, and you're accessing the, it's like, data that's available also through their API errors and then so you're getting the data through them and like running the algorithms and the modeling and stuff basically through their API exactly and so what you, one needs is one needs people with the expertise to code um mm -hmm. it sounds to me like Hector if I understand what you're saying is you know you're saying there are some things that you think this could be valuable for but folks in the community right now don't necessarily have the knowledge base to do this. Um, this might be an interesting thing to explore. You know, it, it's, it is a little a field from what we're doing, right? But like maybe one can find ways for it to not be totally a field from, uh, from what we're doing. Mm -hmm. It would be neat if we could, for instance, and I don't think it's inconceivable that one could, I'm just, totally spitball and it really depends on what data sets are available but like you know could one figure out identify locust swarms in an automated fashion in these maps i that seems actually kind of plausible to me and even more so maybe it's plausible to identify you know associate the swarm with like some sort of taxonomic information you know it's this kind of locust or that kind of locust because their densities are different or this or that or the other You know, and in that way, you could imagine doing things that link up to some of BPRI's interests, um, but that would also maybe connect up with, you know, this notion that they want to be able to monitor what's going on more efficiently, but can't necessarily use tools like this. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm really speculating wildly at this point, but, yeah. but that's the thing that came to mind as I was listening to, to Hector speak about yeah. this. Yeah, there's so many of these like amazing publicly available data sets now and all these different kind of platforms. And I know I, there are like a handful of experts in the sort of locust like modeling world that are, I mean, they're on Hopperlink too. So we could have some of these discussions on there and answer these questions. I feel like I almost every month I hear about somebody new who's like trying to, is starting some kind of like early detection system or trying to do some new type of modeling. Well, Some of them, I don't know what comes about. Um, Another entity in this space is called Planet Labs, right? These guys provide satellite data, you know, to understand the physical world and take action, right? But it's a similar sort of mm -hmm. concept of, you know, if I want to be doing large scale satellite analysis, I don't need to have my own satellites, you know, like mm -hmm. I don't need to have all that expertise, but like I can you know i can you know buy the images i need buy the compute i need i just write the code you know and and even you know i don't even create the language or whatever i just i just write the code i don't know i mean this is maybe we're we're really you know in the non-fruitful direction here but this seems like this seems like an area where one could imagine cross-border collaboration You know, one could imagine cross-border collaboration to address a need that Hector's articulated already kind of having. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this will be a fun thing to any yeah, chat about on Hopperlink and like ask some open-ended questions. Um, 
there's a number of these efforts going on from different NGOs and think tanks, but I don't, yeah, I don't know what stages they're at. And I'm obviously not an expert in, in, in this area. So I only know. Uh, nosotros, Rick, tenemos en, la, en el sistema este de alertas que, que vos conocés, tenemos una plataforma que integra información. Entonces ahí tenemos información del monitoreo y captamos información de distintos datasets. Eh, ¿Cómo se llama el nombre del ¿Dijiste el nombre es, de la plataforma? Del plataforma? No, en realidad dentro del mismo proyecto es un, un sistema integral de gestión, un SIG, o un GIS, GIS, en inglés. Okay. Mm -hmm. GIS. Eh, yes. eh, en donde nosotros vemos la información, por ejemplo, de, de vientos, sabemos dónde está la manga en el mapa porque alguien la detectó, pero podemos traer la información de vientos y temperatura. Entonces, en base a esa información, vamos haciendo análisis hacia dónde se podría mover la plaga. Otro factor, por ejemplo, es donde hay focos de calor, hay incendio. Entonces, eso podría ser un factor que provoca que la langosta se desplace. Entonces, se van haciendo distintos análisis de ese lugar y la idea es que ese GIS sea lo más nutrido posible para que la gente que toma decisiones como yo tenga la mayor información posible. ¿no? Bueno, la langosta se va a mover, sí o no, hacia dónde se va a mover, cuándo se movería, eh, si hace frío o no se mueve. Por ejemplo, entonces, la idea de, de esa plataforma es manejar información de, de, ese, de ese tipo. ¿Y está usando datos que, como que tiene el gobierno argentino o que son...? O, o a nivel, o sí, información a nivel o mundial, global. No, global, sí. Pero bueno, ahí hay mucha información, entonces Pero hay, hay que empezar a ver cu cuál es mejor y no entonces eso es todo un trabajo también. De esa ¿Y la plataforma que están usando, o sea, no es algo, es algo privado que están usando ustedes? O sea, no es un, una compañía de otro, de una compañía privada que desarrolla el plataforma o...? No, Senasa. So they have, an, they have an internal sí, do, platform. Dos personas de Senasa, yo y una más, o una más. Y que, han des, que han desarrollado el plataforma. Sí. They have an internal platform that they developed, a small group of people that they use, that integrates like a, a bunch of different available data, just kind of um, wind and temperature and things like that to make predictions and probabilities like, oh, if there's a swarm, but then it's cold that night, then they're going to like, then they're going to be down on the ground and so just integrate as much information as possible to make Um, educated guesses to like keep updating the alert system about where things might be going. Um, I want to be respectful of Hector's time and everyone's time. Um, so this was kind of a little one-sided. We pumped you for information this whole time, Hector. Um, but certainly um, feel free um, to reach out to us or ask any questions on Hopperlink or just email us directly. Um, And we're um, we're looking forward to to keeping in touch as well. So um, I know where. Go ahead, Res. Can I maybe just add, add one, like you know, one last question, Hector? Are there you know, based on this conversation, right? Are there specific things like if there's one thing you would love to follow up on, or see us do more of, or something like that from this conversation? What would it What would it be? Como que necesitas vos de nosotros, o sea, como si hay algo que puede ser algo chiquito, pero como estamos tratando de hacer un puente entre como lo que estamos haciendo nosotros con toda esa cosa genética y todo lo que está okay. haciendo vos, o sea, en el futuro, ¿qué sería como cuál comunicación o conexión sería importante para vos? Bueno, eh, respecto a esto, nosotros, eh, nosotros, por ejemplo, en el mapa que les mostré, eh, encontramos la en el mapa, en el que les conté anterior manta, eh, nada, solo en el 10% encontramos langostas. Y en ese, en, en ese 10%, todas eran langostas solitarias, digamos, que no estaban gregarizadas. Entonces, poder en, entender el momento en que esa langosta pasa a ser gregaria y se puede formar un enjambre sería importante para nosotros. No sé mm. si, si logras entender, no sé si, si hay una langosta sola, yo no la controlo. O sea, no hay riesgo. Ahora, ¿en qué momento las langostas uh -huh. que yo estoy viendo son un riesgo y yo uh -huh. tengo que controlar? Entonces, nosotros no, no, no lo sabemos realmente. Eh, solamente nos guiamos por la densidad. Pero seguramente uh -huh. hay, algún, hay factores que determinan ese cambio, digamos. Entonces, poder entender en qué momento eso va a ocurrir sería más fácil para nosotros. Porque tendríamos la decisión de controlar o no con un sustento científico que a veces es lo que nos falta, ¿no? Que bueno, un investigador mm. dice que en este momento hay que controlar. Entonces eso es muy importante para nosotros porque nos da cierto um, respaldo. En la, ¿Sí? en la experiencia suya hay, hay situaciones cuando hay mucha 
mucha langosta solitaria que, y nada pasa, o sea, no o te, puede ser o son chiquitas, o digo sí. pocas. Son, son pocas, la coloración es verde, entonces sabemos que no, no es un problema, pero quizás lo sea, y no yeah, sabemos bueno. cuándo exactamente. One of the things that um, Hector's relating that is like, a, he thinks a really critical connection with the BPRI and something that would be very useful for them is that in all this modeling, there's obviously a biological component and they don't really care about solitarious grasshoppers and there can be a decent amount of them and they're green um, and they don't, they don't really cause that much of a problem. And so like understanding like the landscape effects and that inflection point of like strategic Kind of like strategic, uh, sim like um, decision-based rules of like when it matters, when things are going to like tip past that threshold and Gregorize is a really critical biological component of that model. That's kind of a black box because um, it just because there's you know it's it, hoppers at a at a location that are solitarious are noise sort of that it's that are a sort of a, a can be a waste of time from a management standpoint. So that's kind of one thing that he's excited about seeing sort of development in that area. Thank you, yeah, this is wonderful. Understanding plasticity, <laughs> plus phenotypic plasticity and landscape interactions. Okay, well, uh, yeah, well, thanks so much, Hector. Thank this was fantastic. Thank thanks for- Thank you all. Uh, Muchas gracias. <laughs> We'll be in touch. Yeah. Bye bye. 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 Thanks, everyone.